Hello, my loves. Welcome to True Crime Wine Wednesday or True Crime Wine, whatever day it is that Sherilyn is able to upload lately. If you're new here, hi, hello, welcome. I am Sherilyn and I'm so glad you found me. If you're not new here, welcome back. Thank you for joining me every single upload. We are going to get back to Wednesdays, I promise. I love and I appreciate you so much. Thank you so much for the feedback on the last video with the new background and setup. I heard you loud and clear. You you like this setup, but you wanted me a little bit closer. I feel like, you know, like we're a little snuggled in a little bit more. And I appreciate that. You know, I thought that was really cute that you felt like I was too far away from you. So <laughs> come on, come on, babe. come on, come on, come on. I kind of feel sad though that you can't really see the green couch anymore. I really am loving this like emerald green. So it's a work in progress. Pro 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 I think I'll try to put it on like some slats or something and go up a little high. I don't know. We'll figure it out. It's it's all a learning curve right now and um, we're just flying by the seat of our pants as we go. So just keep the, what's the word? I would say constructive criticism, but oh my gosh, I don't know like what is with this week. Lord, I, I, I just, I feel like I, I cannot make anybody happy out there. I'm getting comments like, oh, you look terrible with your hair pulled up. It's too distracting. Have it down. I'm getting, don't have your hair <laughs> down. You need it pulled up. Your makeup's too heavy. It's got to be lighter. Holy moly. My intros are too long. Well, <laughs> joke's on you because that's not going anywhere. It's how I am. Anyways, you guys have always told me you love and appreciate me for who I am. And so as hard as it is sometimes to just take those comments with a grain of salt and move on. You know, they stick with you a little bit, but you know, I'm sorry if you feel that way, but I'm still gonna do my hair the way I do it, how I wanna do it that day and wear my makeup and express myself with different colors. Anyways, you can't please everybody, so yeah. <laughs> All right, today's case is one that has enthralled me. This is enthralled the right word. Let's look while we're on it because somebody will tell me if it's not. Hey Siri. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, she last time she didn't even like talk to me. She just, anyways. Um, what does enthralled mean? This is what she does to me. She it just leaves. She's like, I don't feel like answering that. Hey Siri. Uh huh. <laughs> What does enthralled mean? Enthrall means capture the fascinated attention of. Do you want to hear the next one? Nope, that's good. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. She used to say goodbye. So rude. So, yes, enthralled. All right, it's riddle time. Different lights make me strange. Thus, into different sizes, I will change. What am I? All right, let's get started. Grab your goodies. You know the drill, whether that's a glass of red, a mouse pad because you're starting your work day, a bag of fuzzy peaches because it's always a good time for fuzzy peaches. I am having a watermelon Italian soda with some vodka in it, so cheers. The fizziness has um, gone away. All right, today we are talking about the shocking crimes of Andre Thomas. It's a case that I have never heard of before and one that it's really kept me up at night because while what happened to the victims is utterly devastating, there are so many people besides just their killer that I feel are responsible in this case, mostly because he was begging for help and he was rejected. And then after that, he was sentenced to death. I am fully aware of how not okay it is to take someone's life or in this case, multiple people's lives. To get a full picture though, let's start at the beginning and talk about who inmate 999493 Andre Thomas is. Andre was born on March 17th, 1983 in Sherman, Texas. And he was born into a family with an already strong history of mental illness. By the time Andre's grandmother Vivian was only a teenager, she was already very heavily dependent on alcohol. And while she was in this young, vulnerable state, she meets a man named Johnny, who is Andre's grandfather, and he was also an alcoholic and severely abusive to Vivian. He was so cruel to her that he actually once pushed her down to the ground while she was pregnant, and the fall was so hard that it caused the baby in utero's foot to break. And even prior to meeting Johnny, she seemed to be looking for a strong, 
fatherly figure to maybe take care of her and also raise a family with. So by the time she was 14, she already started having children and eventually had nine children with five different fathers, which hey, is, is totally okay if you're, if you're out there searching for Mr. Right, but each one of them, she was just attracting more abuse and more trauma. After Vivian left Johnny, she married a man named Walter Martin. And again, the cycle continued. He was also an alcoholic and very abusive. One evening, actually, while they were in a drunken argument, Walter put a gun to Vivian's head and her 17-year-old son, Gregory, tried to get involved to get Walter away from his mother. And Walter ended up shooting and killing Gregory instead. It doesn't sound like it was something he was very sorry for. Allegedly, he told people he planted one of Vivian's kids and that he planned on planting the rest of them one day. Vivian's daughter, Rochelle, was Andre's mother and she was the closest to Greg. So after he passed, she had a really hard time getting past it. I don't think she actually ever did get past it. This loss led her to cope with alcohol. She also suffered from depression, and according to her siblings, she was allegedly also sexually assaulted by Walter. In her late teens, Rochelle meets a man named Danny Thomas. It sounds like they both attracted to one another because their family dynamic was pretty much the same. Generational mental illness, violence, alcoholism. Rochelle claimed that she had this gift from God that was passed on to her from her mother Vivian. And it wasn't this angelic, I, I receive messages from God and I'm close to him type thing. I guess they would hear messages of fear that would come through in dreams or I guess nightmares. Andre was the fifth of Rochelle's six children. She had all boys and their upbringing was quite unstable. There was a lot of men that were in and out of the house. There was a lot of moving to different neighborhoods, different states, and oftentimes they relied on their church to just pay for their electricity so that they could have lights and heat. Rochelle isn't described as a very present mother. She didn't really seem to care what her kids were doing. She didn't have tabs on them. They just kind of were forced to take care of each other. One of the things that really affected the kids on top of having to watch her suffer with depression and drinking was that she would have these men coming and going out of the house. And for the most part, she wouldn't really try to mask what was going on you know she would prance around the house minimally clothed or not at all with these guys and the children were subjected to be witness to it which is quite traumatic for any young child but despite this Andre really thrived when he was a little boy in school he received outstanding marks by grade two he was placed in the talented and gifted classes and his second grade teacher says that he was an absolute joy to have in her class he also loved Sunday school he was described as the child who would always raise his hand first to answer the questions. I think a large part of his love for Sunday school was that there must have been some form of stability there. His parents, again, didn't really care where or what their children were doing. So Sunday school was a routine for them and they were surrounded by other adults and got to participate and learn and just play with other kids. While they were at home, Andre would distract himself with drawing. He was a very talented little artist. And one of the things that he loved to draw the most was cars. And he'd often dry, draw cars that he hoped to one day design and have built in the future. Like I said, he started school as such a bright child with a really promising future, but unfortunately the home situation was so unstable with them always moving. He never had time to settle in somewhere and make friends. By the time he was in second grade, he had already been to three different schools in three different cities. It was around grade two, three that teachers started to notice that Andre would drift off into another world and he started telling kids in class that he was a Mortal Kombat player named Raiden. I'm sure everybody from the 90s is, who liked Mortal Kombat would be like, come on, Sherilyn, Raiden. I wasn't a Mortal Kombat person. He also told them openly that he heard voices. By the time he was only 10, he had already attempted to un unalive himself. He did this after his mother told him she should have aborted him. By 11, he was charged with mischief when he had stolen some golf carts and damaged them. And then the following year, he kicked it up a notch and stole a whole car 
and then crashed it into the ditch so he was also charged with theft there. Neither of his parents went to meet with his probation officer when he went there to figure out a plan to get him back on track and keep him successful at that. He had an aunt named Angel that did the best she could to keep an eye out on him, let him know that she he had somebody to confide in in her but it was primarily the justice system that kind of started to take over and keep a better eye on Andre and keep tabs on him than his own family did. I mean I read that his parents didn't even know which school which son went to. Just no idea where their kids were during the day. It was Andre who went to a judge and asked if he could provide him with a work permit so that he could get a job when he was 14 years old so that he could pay off the court fees and restitution and he was told he was too young to work. As Andre grew older, his grades started to reflect the instability that was going on at home and he had to repeat grade 7 over. At one point, he managed to get back into the gifted and talented program. Things were looking like they were going back on track and then his mother informs him that the family is moving to Oklahoma. So he informs his probation officer and he's placed in a juvenile detention facility because he can't move states. Imagine your stability in life was your probation officer judges a juvenile detention center and school. It was at school though that Andre did find somebody who showed him love and was somebody that he could finally rely on. Her name was Laura Boren. They started dating and sound like so many couples spending all their time together, young, in love. People who knew them said that they were a very cute couple and they always looked so happy to be with each other. When they were only 16, Laura gets pregnant, which can be very scary, I imagine. I was 19 when I had my oldest daughter and that was terrifying. But Laura and Andre seemed really happy to start a family of their own. They had a little boy and named him Andre Jr. I think most people called him Little Andre. Laura and Andre were said to be wonderful parents. Laura is described as a natural who just took to motherhood instantly and just had that caring and maternal side. And despite not having a really good example of what a healthy family is, Andre was a wonderful dad. He dropped out of school so that he could take care of his family, earned his GED, and then worked various jobs to pay for the bills. One of them was digging graves at a local cemetery. I mean, someone's got to do it. I just don't know if it could be me. Although Laura and little Andre were good for Andre, uh, you know, having a family and just love itself isn't enough to cure mental illness, unfortunately. Those voices that Andre was hearing when he was younger were getting stronger and there were several more attempts that he took on his life. He would get treatment and it seemed to help but only temporarily. And then their home situation was becoming a little bit like his upbringing in terms of bouncing from place to place. There was a point in time where they had a home just together and then they moved to Laura's parents' house and then from there they ended up moving to Andre's mother Rochelle's house. For a little while that seemed to be working out okay for them. Well enough that on March 17th, 2001, Andre and Laura get married on his 18th birthday. But only two weeks after their wedding, Rochelle kicks them out of her house. I couldn't find any information on the dynamic there, but I'm assuming that when they were originally living with Laura's parents and then leaving there to live with Andre's, something must have gone on there that they weren't wanting in their, their home because when they were kicked out of Rochelle's house, it was only Laura and little Andre that were allowed to go back to Laura's parents' house and Andre went and moved with his brother. So now they're newlyweds with a little boy and they are not living together. They couldn't sustain this family dynamic. So after only being married for four and a half months, they separate, which is really hard on Andre because he was already very vulnerable and spiral at first, when they separated, they were doing the co-parent thing, but Andre was doing some seasonal work mowing lawns and he lost that job and was unable to pay his electricity. So oftentimes when Laura would go to drop off little Andre, there wouldn't be any heat or running water in the house. So she started scaling back his time with him. It sounds like Andre was hopeful that in the future things would work out and he would be able to get back together with Laura and be a family again, but it didn't turn out that way. After a couple years of being apart, Laura moved on with a man named Bryant Hughes and they had a little girl together that they named Leia. Not surprising, this really affected Andre. He 
apparently told his dad that he felt like he was in a circle that he couldn't break out of. He said he was feeling really helpless because he was seeking out counselors for his suicidal thoughts and these voices that are just intensifying in his head and they would kind of go on a treatment plan with him but nothing seemed to work. If it's anything like what I've experienced, I can understand. It can be really frustrating. There were times where I would go to counseling and I needed so much more than what was being offered in front of me. They would try to tell me just to do techniques like, oh, try tapping your foot when you're feeling this way or think of five senses. And that is really great and a great tool for somebody who might only temporarily be experiencing uh, depression or anxiety. But when you actually have a chemical imbalance and this is your life and you need medication to solve that, and I wasn't on any at that time, you know, tapping my feet and thinking of five things that are around me and touching things, it's, that's, it, it's not enough. For Andre, the voices in his head he described as being so loud that it was like he was in the middle of a heavy metal concert and like that is how loud and blaring it was inside of him. Because of this, he made several more attempts to end his life and the goal was that he just wanted it to stop. He just wanted silence and calm. With each attempt, he'd go to the hospital but then not long after he'd be released. As I was reading about what he was experiencing, it sounded like with each release, it affected him more. And I can I can relate to that because it's almost like you were like, okay, well, no one's taking me seriously. You almost just get scared. Like, am I gonna be like this forever? So each time he's being released, his behavior is changing more. One thing he started doing was he would just stop talking. He would place duct tape, over his face and not speak to anybody for days. If his family asked him questions, he would just shake his head or nod. And then he started becoming obsessed with a dollar bill that he started carrying around. And he would tell people that there was a code inside of it that was the key to unlocking his salvation. In March, 2004, he was the worst that he had ever been. On top of that, his Aunt Angel, who was the only woman that he considered a confidant of his, died when she had complications to uh, from a lung disease. To cope with this loss, he started drinking heavily and was also getting stoned on a cough medicine called coracidin. Chor- he wound up overdosing on this cough medicine actually and went to the hospital and then was transferred to a mental health facility because while he was at the hospital, he told the nurses, you know, I've been trying to just end it. Can you do it for me? I want out of here. My understanding is from here, they didn't feel like they were equipped enough to help Andre. So they let him leave, but they say head over to this hospital that was supposed to be close by and they'll help you out there. Getting the runaround and clearly not being taken as seriously as he felt he needed to, Andre doesn't show up at the other hospital. So there's a warrant that is placed for his arrest, but no police officer enforced it. No one went looking for him. Days later, he overdoses again. And this time while he's high, he stabs himself. He walks into the ER and the on-call doctor deemed him suicidal in his notes. He wrote that Andre told him he was trying to cross over to heaven. The doctor actually used the term in his notes as really mentally ill. He said Andre described feeling like he was in another dimension, which is also something that his friend said that he was saying around this time. He described it almost like the movie Groundhog Day, that he was just living the exact same day over and over and over again. This on-call doctor referred Andre to the mental health unit at the hospital and he filled out an emergency detention order to hold Andre against his will but I guess while they were waiting for this order to be signed by a judge the nurses said Andre just wandered off and they lost him. Apparently the hospital did contact the police but there's no record of the police ever going to Andre's mother's house, his brother's. It was two days later after he wandered away from the hospital on March 27th 2004 that Andre goes to Laura's house. He kicked in her door and sees that Laura is alone with the kids and in a very quick frenzied attack he kills Laura. He then kills his four-year-old son Andre Jr as well as Laura's 13-month-old baby girl, Leia. 
Andre said that he was hearing voices from God that were saying Laura was Jezebel, Andre Jr. was the Antichrist, and little Leia was just evil. He believed his mission to save the world was to take their lives. He also wanted to save them by removing this possession that was in them and he did so by removing their hearts because that is where he believed the demons were controlling them from. He then turned the knife on himself and intended to die but he didn't. He left Laura's and walked home and then made a phone call to her parents. They weren't home so he left a message. The voicemail said, um, Sherry, this is Andre. I need y'all's help. Something bad has happened to me and it keeps happening and I don't know what's going on. I need some help. I think I'm in hell. I need help. Somebody needs to come and help me. I need help bad. I'm desperate. I'm afraid to go to sleep. So when you get this message, come by my house, please. Hello? After he hangs up, he confesses to his girlfriend who is at his mother's house and she says that he needs to go to the police station and turn himself in. It's his mom who drives him to the police station and drops him off at the front door. He walks in and he's immediately brought to the hospital and treated for the injuries that he made to himself and then brought back to the station where he provided a full confession. He told the police he had received this message from God to kill Jezebel and the Antichrist and the evil spirit. At the crime scene, he had also left the dollar bill that he was so obsessed with and told the police that he left it behind because the eye on it was evil. After his confession, he is arrested and while he's being assessed by a nurse at the jail, he tells her that his wife and kids aren't actually dead and that he had removed their hearts to free them of evil and that now they were themselves and alive. While in jail, Andre refused the anti-psychotic medication that was being offered to him. He felt like they were trying to kill him there, so he chose to read his Bible instead and thought that he could get healed that way. Day in and out, he is reading this Bible, and then when he gets to Matthew 5.29, he commits another incomprehensible act. The verse reads, if your right eye causes you sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. And that is precisely what Andre did. He removed his right eye in his cell. After Andre took out his eye, the legal proceedings stopped. To prevent him from harming himself or anybody else, he was also strapped up with these large mittens. And then three doctors evaluated him. There was one that was appointed in the jail, one from the state, and one by the court. Each of them said that Andre suffered from some form of schizophrenia and they found him incompetent to stand trial. So he was transferred to the Texas State Hospital. From here though, nothing really changed that they actually got worse. He continued to hear voices, talked a lot to himself. He also had night terrors almost every single night where he felt like scorpions and tarantulas were all over his body trying to kill him. Despite this and his clear need for help, after 47 days of evaluation, the doctors deemed that his hallucinations were substance induced and that he was exaggerating his mental illness. <laughs> exaggerating his mental illness his whole entire life while this man is looking at you with only one eye because he tore out the other one and he is sitting there with freaking secured mittens so he can't hurt himself or anybody else. One of the reasons that they said he was competent enough to stand trial was because he was cooperative with staff members at the hospital. So to them, they felt like that didn't really mean that he was unwell because other patients weren't cooperative, so he was good to go. So he goes to trial and the defense argues that he is innocent by reasons of insanity. And that despite being admitted to facilities assessed by numerous doctors, he slipped through the cracks over and over and over again. The prosecutor's argument was that while they were aware that he had some history of mental illness, questionable, and they don't believe that it was a planned attack on Laura and the kids, they did feel like 
he did do it impulsively and that he knew what he was doing. So he was still responsible. In the end, the jury agreed with the prosecution. He was found guilty and only four days after that ruling, on November 3rd, 2005, his sentence was death. Because of the doctor's findings, he was placed in a regular prison on death row. And death row is not designed for any form of rehabilitation. You're just there waiting to die. There's no programs he could attend. So for an inmate like Andre, who's already debilitated by mental health, there's no avenue for him to go to get better. Most of the doctors who did go to speak with Andre, it just seemed like they couldn't even be bothered to be there and quite frankly, didn't believe him. In one of their notes from assessment, this one doctor says, the right eye appears to be in a fixed closed position. Right eye seems to be missing as per the patient's claim. <laughs> The, ra the rage is heating me up. Allegedly missing an eye. Andre was still hearing voices though. They were as disruptive as ever. Oftentimes they would tell him to bash his head in a wall. Other times he would even have hallucinations of seeing like demons coming out of the wall trying to claw at him. Some of the demons also played music from Queen. That could be a hit and miss though. Me, big Queen fan. My mom, not so much. Next, on July 14th, 2008, Andre managed to get his hands on a sharp object and again tried to harm himself by cutting at his throat. He was treated and given eight stitches and when they asked, why did you do this? His explanation was that he was the cause of all the problems that are going on in the world and if he weren't alive anymore, all of those problems would stop. By 2008, only two years into his sentence, he's really falling apart. He was feeling suicidal, he refused to eat, and then he stopped talking again. It's believed this decline was connected to an incident that happened at the jail. He was placed in a cell next to another inmate who bragged that he was the Antichrist, and this really upset Andre because he felt like he had already removed the Antichrist by what he did to his family. So on December 9th, 2008, he removed his remaining eye and ingested it. While he's being treated by the doctors, he tells them that he did it because he believed that the government could read his thoughts through his eye. So if he made sure that, you know, it wasn't coming back, they couldn't put it back in and then read his thoughts. After the second eye removal, it was then that people believed that maybe jail wasn't a good fit for him. He was then transferred to a prison psychiatric unit at another jail called Jester. As of today, Andre is still locked up in a small cell 23 hours a day. Allegedly, he does seem to be more comfortable here around other prisoners that are also dealing with mental illness. Here, he doesn't believe that the staff are trying to harm him, so he has been successful at taking some medication, but it sounds like the medication that he's on basically just knocks him out for the entire day. While he is awake, he is known to break out in song. Um, he's a big fan of Depeche Mode, so that is often what you'll hear. It's been 13 years since the second eye incident and Texas is still wanting to move forward with his execution. He does have lawyers who are trying to appeal his sentence, but it sounds like things are kind of at a standstill. Joe Brown, who's the district attorney, said he was surprised that Andre had removed his second eye. Not surprised about the first, if he was mentally competent. That's, I guess, what any prisoner does. I don't know. But it was the second eye removal that surprised him. He said that the state would gather Andre's records and look through them and evaluate the situation from there. I just, I feel so upset about this. I mean, while obviously Andre was let down by so many people in his life, so what was Laura and her children. This should not have happened. There is no question that Andre needs to deal with the crimes that he committed, but had his cries for help been listened to even just one of the times, there's a really good chance that Laura and her children would still be here. And then to just, you know, cast him away and, and sentence him to death to just kind of wipe it under the rug, like, okay, we'll, we'll just, we'll just rid of him and have him go on trial as sane. I, I, yeah, I, just, I have no words. And it's so hard because it's like, how can you not be torn here? You know, this wasn't a man who got a kick out of killing people or torturing animals like we've seen. He was somebody who was trying to get help over and over again and just wasn't being heard. I, I just, yeah, I believe that there's just, there's no excuse for those three lives to have been taken. And I don't think that 
Andre should be the only one with those deaths on his conscience. I came across a petition to try and have his death sentence removed and have him provided an appropriate sentence with the care that he needs. I'll leave that in the description for anybody who might be interested in that. Again, this um, it's not to give him a pass and release him and let him go into society. He simply just should have never been put on death row in the first place. Alrighty, that is it for me today, you guys. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't already, please don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs> it means the world to me. I love and I appreciate you so much. Here's the answer to your riddle. Different lights make me strange, thus into different sizes. I will change. What am I? The answer is the pupil of an eye. You guys are all so smart. I know so many people are going to get it. I <laughs> did not. All right. I will see you in the next video. I will miss you terribly. Until then, make sure to love each other, love yourself, and I will see you soon.